I've been doing this for the last 10 years and I uh, never knew I was gonna go to medical school to be like a menopause doctor. In fact, I went into OBGYN. Right. And after a year in OBGYN, I was like, oh no, no, I can't, my beauty rest, like I can't do this. So I, I then um, transitioned back into internal medicine and then I wound up doing a two-year fellowship in what's called Advanced Women's Health at Cleveland Clinic. And I was very excited to learn about contraception and um, postpartum conditions. And my mentor, Dr. Thacker, all she did was menopause. And so this is 2014, so rewind wow. 10 years ago. And people would come from all over to Cleveland, which we call the mistake on the lake. So it's not like you're coming to New York City. And they just, you know, had no idea what were all of these symptoms and HRT was really taboo. It is still now to a degree, but even more so 10 years ago. It was like the underground HRT railroad, like you had to go to right. Cleveland or something to get right. it. And so I would just see patients with her and I was like, wow, what is going on? And I read through the research about hormone therapy and how safe it is, how it protects women's health. And I was just, as everyone learns about HRT, or for a lot of our patients, um, when they start HRT, I always say the first, sometimes the first um, emotion you have is like anger, because you're like, what? For seven years, right. I've been feeling this way, and I just, you know, this patch really helped so much. How did nobody tell me And it's me all this? natural. It is. It's not, it's not like we a have, pharmaceutical that doctors don't think twice about prescribing. There's a difference between the synthetics um, and the bioidenticals, which is what the majority of our patients use, which is a plant-based estrogen, still made in a pharmacy, but really so safe. And then I would spend time with Dr. Thacker and her patients would come back and they were like, new people. And I was like, what is this area of medicine? I did like a year, I, I was a women's studies major um, in college. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I did like a, oh gosh, I did like this whole th thesis on like the human genome project and how it's going to be like ageist and racist. Okay. That's like my, like in my twenties, I was like a real spitfire. And then I did a year of OBGYN and then I did all of this internal medicine residency. No one ever muttered the word menopause for maybe more than, you know, a few sentences and definitely not hormone therapy. So when I learned about it and I saw how much it improved women's lives, just like you, I was like, wow. And then now to sort of hear your story and to see women talking about it and really celebrating World Menopause Day, which, you know, really five years ago, 10 years ago, nobody ever really talked about. Like we've come such a long way. There's still a lot to do and there's like so much to talk about. And you know, we've got pharmaceuticals are an issue. We've got physician education, which you already mentioned, access to care, so many things to work on. Um, but I'm so glad we're here and thanks yes, for sharing your of story. Of course, of course. So I know when I reached out to everybody, a lot of the response that I got was, oh my gosh, I have so many questions. So ask away and we have the expert here to answer or if you have just general thoughts let us know or if you're open to like sharing what you're kind of going through and like wondering is this what it could be this is like a good safe space safe space <laughs> to you know what might be good mm -hmm. um i was thinking we could go over like some basic definitions yes and that, okay, I thought that might be helpful too, just to kind of set the stage as you are asking your question of like, so if we think about menopause, menopause is the word we hear a lot, but menopause is one day that you can celebrate. It's after 12 months of not having a period. Now, some women like me don't have periods because I have an IUD, so I never really know if I'm having a period. So then it's a little bit more tricky for me, but um, if you are someone who's having periods, a year of no periods, that day you're like, this is menopause. This day is menopause. And then the next day is postmenopause. And then the next day after that, and all the days after that, you're actually considered postmenopausal. And that's because at menopause, your ovaries, which make all of your hormones, your estrogen, well, not all of your hormones, but the main one, like estrogen and some of our testosterone, which is a female hormone and we'll come back to, um, they pretty much retire. And so you don't make those hormones anymore. Isn't that crazy? Like men make their sex hormones their entire life. If we had evolved, I think, on a more like evolving basis, our ovaries should have lasted, menopause should be like 75, but it's still not. Um, so, so menopause is like the one year of no period. Um, and then you're actually always postmenopausal. 
Then there's perimenopause, which can last years, even up to 10 years. And there's a lot of discourse around perimenopause because it's when women start experiencing these symptoms of the hormonal fluctuations because they're declining, but they're also really volatile. And if that's 10 years and the average age of menopause is 51, um, that means it could start in your 40s. But that's just the average. I have a lot of patients in their late 30s. Um, so I have some patients in their 20s. Um, I certainly also have women who experience perimenopause up to like 53, 54, 55. So it's just um, an interesting period of time because I think that's also when as women we start like using healthcare more. We start feeling like stuff is happening to us and we're like, no, I've never been to the doctor. Outside of like my pap smear and delivering my baby, like what am I doing here? Um, and you could experience all types of symptoms, vertigo of which we talked about and my best friend's experiencing. So, um, you know, it could start with fatigue, um, which is pretty, you know, generalized. So, but why else are you kind of all of a sudden feeling like you can't get out of bed, mood changes, so anxiety or depression where you're like, I am not an anxious or depressed person, but all of a sudden, you know, you're feeling your mental space is in a different spot. So perimenopause um, is uh, something that women can experience for a long time. And it's really helpful to figure out if that's part of what's happening because you can feel like you're freaking going crazy trying to like put all these symptoms together and no doctors really putting them together. And then they're like sending you to eight different doctors. So that's perimenopause. Um, and then there's also early menopause, which is menopause before age 40. Um, and then that's premature menopause rather. And then early menopause is before age 45. And why that's important is a lot of women now are experiencing earlier menopause because they're having their ovaries removed for things like BRCA mutation, or we have better testing to determine if you're at high risk for breast to ovarian cancer. And a lot of the treatment is taking your ovaries out. So that's great. That's gonna help to reduce your risk of ovarian cancer, but um, then you're left in menopause like overnight at you know 39. So those are some of the definitions. You've got premature and early menopause, perimenopause, menopause, and then postmenopause. And I'm sure we're all in sort of different phases of that. Um, and hopefully that's good to sort of set the stage. But if you guys have, you know, I could talk forever. So um, if anyone does want to ask a question or share a story or anything, we really wanted to leave it really open. Yes. So I talked to my, my uh, oncologist two days ago, and I had this video I have this list and I'm like, I'm exhausted. I'm sleeping worse than ever. My body aches. You know, I have all these things and she says, but do you have hot flashes? I think that the hot flash is deceiving too, because it's also, you're running at a high temperature. Like you're just like warm a lot. So I just thought that that was me. Like early on, that was one of the first kind of symptoms I experienced where I was just, I was always kind of hot. And then later, it comes more like out of the blue of now I'm heating up and like what's going on uh, or while you're like, you know, hustling around the city or like trying to get to an appointment, then all of a sudden like, yeah, you would be a little hot and bothered, but like to like a whole different <laughs> level of hot and bothered, which like also makes you really anxious. So I don't think necessarily like hot flashes, that's like the one thing you always hear, but it's not, it's not so much for me in the beginning of like all of a sudden I'm having a hot flash. Like sometimes I would just be hot and want to stand in the refrigerator. Like, did you feel that she was asking that? Yeah, did she say that? Well, oh, right, so the reason oh, she asked me that, that right, okay. yeah, she said two things to me. And I still get my period pretty regularly. We don't normally give it to people who have their period still. So, and it's really only for hot flashes. And I, she wanted me to say, yes, I have hot flashes, so she could prescribe it. So she, at the end of the conversation, was like, sounds like you have hot flashes. I'm like, sure. sure. <laughs> so now I've got a little patch on my butt today. Woo! OK, good. Um, are you feeling a difference, or you just got it like two days? OK. Two days, fresh. Fresh right. patch. I think pretty quickly you'll feel it. Yes, let me address this. So I want to introduce two of my amazing clinicians, Rebecca and Natalie. So um, they work with me at the collaborative. So we have a telemedicine practice open in almost 50 states. We're like three down. And um, we hear this all the time. 
And uh, to answer this question, I think I need to kind of like take you back a little bit. And I actually just posted about this yesterday. So hormone therapy, there's four FDA approved indications, but there's actually like a long list of things it really helps with. And it's interesting because there are some clinicians that um, I guess uh, you could say more conservatively, like only want to prescribe it if there's absolutely FDA approved indications. Although it looks like your doctor was kind of like, she, you, you know, you tip the scales for her. Um, but there's actually a couple of different questions in there, like what's a hot flash and what's hormone therapy approved for? So it's approved for four things, hot flashes, which, you know, wink, wink, right? Night sweats, um, genitourinary syndrome of menopause. We can talk about vaginal dryness next um, and osteopenia. But we also see, Rebecca, Natalie, and I see this all the time. Hormone therapy helps with the fatigue. Now, is it a miracle? I wish it was. It's kind of close to a miracle, but a lot of things are probably going on at once. But it can help with fatigue hair loss, hair thinning, joint aches and pains, the brain fog, the cognition. Um, it can help with uh, so many things. Also some of the more rare symptoms like the vertigo or the tinnitus or just so many things it can really help with, which is actually because we have estrogen receptors from head to toe. And so it's kind of a disservice that we call estrogen our sex hormones because it does so much in our entire body. Um, and so these FDA indications, interestingly, is just what the medicine is approved for, and it costs a lot of money and a lot of time to get approval. I mean, could it have approval for things like joint aches and pains? I guess if there is enough money or fatigue, maybe if there is enough money and time, I'm not holding my breath. But the thing is, is that a lot of physicians with, because they haven't had good education um, or a lot of experience in prescribing it are like hesitant to do so unless you're like, yes, I have these drenching hot flashes. Um, but that is just, it can do so much more. And exactly, hot flashes don't have to be the like coming up your head and then like going down. It can be a heat intolerance, which is just like a lot of my patients say I used to be the, the cold baby in the office and always have my sweaters. And now I'm like, like my patients celebrate when they can wear a sweater again sometimes because they just feel so overheated a lot. Um, and this is actually, this point is, is very important, um, which is HRT and perimenopause too. So can you use HRT if you're still having periods? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, it's so helpful. Um, it's, it's the reason there's this pause from a lot of clinicians is probably because they haven't had the experience of doing it for a long time. And neither would I, unless I ended up at Cleveland Clinic for two years and saw all of this. So I got to have this enriching, you know, educational experience where I got so used to prescribing it to women who are still menstruating. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, there's so much to unpack in your question there, or you're just, you know, the experience that you just had. So I'm really happy to hear you got your patch on and you're starting your progesterone and it'll be such an interesting journey to see um, because I do think so many women benefit from um, hormone therapy at the minimum of just seeing what symptoms get better with HRT, if anything, like using it as like almost a diagnostic tool. And then the other part of that is like, um, people ask me all the time, do you think birth control pills are hormone therapy? To which I say, yes, birth control pills are another form of hormone therapy. It's interesting though, because sort of the, the discourse is that like hormone therapy, you're giving yourself estrogen and it's gonna cause breast cancer, which is not true or hurt you. But birth control pills, we'll, we'll just prescribe those all the time. And a lot of gynecologists, um, you know, uh, not maliciously, however, are very happy to prescribe birth control pills for perimenopausal symptoms, but they're both forms of hormone therapy. And very often the postmenopausal doses, because one, they're separate and they're bioidentical, which we touched upon, actually tend to work a lot better. So kudos to you. I'm really excited to see like how your journey goes. Yes, yes. And I can see from my Yes, yes. And if you need a second opinion, we're all licensed in New York State, so. <laughs> I have to tell you a story of a patient. Um, this story will break your heart. Um, I had a patient who I think she had an ablation. And so an ablation is um, a procedure to help stop the heavy bleeding if you're just having bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. So she wasn't getting any periods, but she was having all the symptoms. So she went to like three different doctors. They didn't want to give her HRT. And then she went to another doctor and they said, okay, we'll give you HRT, but we have to check your blood. And she was like, why? And she's like, they're like, just, just to see your labs. And there she was like, okay. So they gave her a patch and then they called her back a week later 
and they're like, your FSH is low. You're, you're in perimenopause. You're not in menopause. We're not going to prescribe the patch anymore. And she just, she had worn it for like a week. She felt better. And then they told her, because her lab work showed that she wasn't menopausal, they were not going to continue to prescribe it. And so there's, this is, these are stories that are uh, alerting us to the fact that there's like still a long way to go. And like women are complicated. And, you know, when it comes to studying our reproductive uh, life, we're, we're definitely good if we want, to, when we, we do so much during our reproduct, early reproductive years, but there's so much in our later reproductive years. We may not be like making babies, but like our bodies are still having hormones that, that that part of our later reproductive years, there's so much that needs to be relearned or studied and addressed better. I think on one of your posts recently, somebody referred to it as adult puberty. Oh, yes. And uh -huh. like the changes that you go through, through puberty, while you're pregnant, post-pregnancy, why is this change something that is not talked about and addressed? I know. And like, we love it. We could talk about it all day. Our jobs are also like bringing people together and like validating um, women's stories and like validating women's like experiences and physiologic experiences and saying like, you're not cr cr crazy. Like these things are real and they're really happening. And so like, we love our jobs so much because even if it's just helping with validating, educating, and then it's a huge bonus when you get your HRT and you feel like amazing again. Um, but it, such a big part of what we love is just like sh having these sort of shared experiences. They're not always the same. Um, and being able to just talk about them together. What's your favorite part, Rebecca? Just to have that validation. They're like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm feeling. And that there's hope. And that no one woman's journey is the same. And to and a lot of it, I, you know, I could share because I am in late period menopause. So, you know, when we talked about some of those depressive symptoms and the, the dark thoughts, you know, a lot of things that women are just embarrassed to tell someone about. And so they have just a safe place to say, yeah, I, I did think about those thoughts and I don't know why I'm thinking that about, you know, my children or leaving my job or not. One woman took time off away from her job. None of us should have to leave our career for amount of time to, to try and get ourselves together. So yeah, I love all of that. Just validating the patient, telling them that I'm listening, that this, this can happen and that your journey is your journey and no one gets to tell you how it's supposed to be. And and then the end where they come back and they feel better, they feel great. And it might not be everything and it might take a little bit of time and as long as everyone's on that same page and and you have open communication with your specialist, it just, it's there's no better feeling than them coming back and saying, I feel like myself, saying yeah. That's the best part. That yeah. is the best part. You know, yeah. it's such a hot topic that I feel like our mothers and grandmothers didn't talk about it. They were told to just suffer, keep calm, carry on. And, um, and now they're deficient mm -hmm. and having heart disease and osteoporosis and all of these things that most likely could have been avoided if they weren't just deprived. That hits so, uh, that hits really hard. And I see a lot of my patients will say this exactly. I saw my mom. I'm looking at my mom, she's you know, got osteopenia, she's so frail, she's got heart disease, like, and I'm hearing all these things about the benefits of hormone therapy, like, is this true? Is this gonna help me? Can I start like this? Uh, or can I start on hormone therapy if I'm a good candidate? And I do think this aspect is really um, real. We're looking at our parents, uh, or you may be looking at your mom's and generation and sort of thinking like, Oh boy, I want to. I cannot. We age differently, and we're seeing it in terms of women lifting weights and you know switching up our diets and you know being really health conscious. And I think menopause is like a crucial part of that. That's why I always say it's the most important transition in a woman's life because it really is going to set up like the next you know three, four, five decades of how you're going to feel, um, chronic disease management, um, and it's so interesting that like one little patch can really make such a huge difference. And this has been sort of 
deemed dangerous and harmful and taboo for so long, and it's and there's no evidence to show that that's true. So that's why we're like, we're just gonna keep rallying. Right. We're gonna keep yeah. going. About there it. was actually a cool generation of women who are probably now like in their 80s that got a lot of Premarin. And there, I have a couple of patients, yes, because in the 80s and 90s, um, oral Premarin, which is the synthetic um, estrogen, uh -oh. um, was was um, widely prescribed. So in the 80s, um, primarily in the 80s, or probably late 70s into the early 90s, um, most women were offered estrogen shortly after um, menopause, um, and that was Premarin or Prempro. And actually, you know, we could talk about where it's sourced from and all those things, but they did fantastic. And they're in their 80s. And they're in their, 80s, in their 80s. And there's like a handful of them. So then in the early 2000s is when the study came out that it was dangerous and harmful. So most women then were really scared. But there was like this cohort of women that were like, no, you will not take these from my cold dead hands. And like I still have some women in their 70s, 80s who are on their estrogen, on their Premarin, their oral Premarin. We could talk about that, but, and they're still doing great. But that's really the, the, the you know, before that, nothing. And then you had this kind of Premarin and then nothing. And now sort of this kind of second wave or this like second coming. And I think that one of the cool things about midlife and menopause is it's really a time to reprioritize yourself. When it's starting with your health, if your health is some of the first sorts of symptoms that bring you to like seeing a doctor and then, you know, things that we've been kind of slacking on for a while, like for me, it's like the exercise. I can't even look at Rebecca. And like, um, you know, just because I got to get back into it and like eating well, you know, I've been eating a lot of dino nuggets, guys. Um, and, you know, I'm just in that stage. And I had children later in life, as more and more women are, we're delaying childbearing um, because for careers and things like that. So, you know, being sort of in the early parts of perimenopause and having little kids, Kids, like it's this moment where I feel like even for me you know things are kind of just happening really fast so it's a really lovely time to reevaluate your career your partnerships um, how you want the next several decades to go and so it can be a really exciting time and there is nothing more satisfying I'm so happy for you there's nothing more satisfying than like this type of medical care because I, I mean um, I'm an internist um, and you know for many years saw patients for uh, you know all the internal medicine things and there is no other medication on the planet that people came back hugging me right. or like hosting parties right there is no yeah. what no one's excited about their low sartan, their antibiotic that gave them diarrhea, um, you know, their, you know, steroids that made their face puffy. Um, but it, you're, it's just such a wonderful career. And as we've been talking, all the journeys are so different. There's no one size that fits all. And it's also really intellectually very fun. So, congrats. I know, yeah. absolutely. Any other questions? I feel like we've been hogging. They kind of definitely in peri or somewhere in the menopause um, spectrum. Yeah. And, um, you know, the hot flashes, the whole thing. And I have an IUD, and like you, like, I have no idea whether I'm not getting my period, right? Yeah. Well, my daughter finally gets her period. Yeah. Month, months ago, I know, obviously. Yeah. And um, I started getting these symptoms that she's getting, like the tender breasts, you know, the little bit of a spotting that I haven't had in 15 years or something, you know. And I'm just wondering, is it in my head or does this actually really happen? Because I know that like, if you work with a friend, you, your cycles kind of get linked up. And I, I've heard of all these white scales, but I just wanted you to shed some light on whether this is actually true or not. It's so interesting um, that you say that. And there's so many things in that you know, statement question as well. So um, if you're like me and you don't get periods because of the certain contraception that we're on, this is actually where lab work can be helpful. Lab work is not necessary to diagnose perimenopause by any means, um, but it can be helpful to see what your follicle stimulating hormone or FSH is over time if you really were kind of interested in when perimenopause goes into menopause and that's when the FSH will go up. Um, so lab work could be helpful, but it's not necessary to make the diagnosis. And estrogen in perimenopause is doing two things. It's lowering and then it's becoming really volatile. So there might be times when it spikes, which is like the breast tenderness, and you're like, ha, what is this? Or the spotting. It can be when you get this like surges of estrogen. 
And your daughter, because we called it puberty in reverse, is also going through puberty. So both of you are having these fluctuating spikes in hormones. And so you're both experiencing like similar book sh bookend symptoms at the same time. Now, the idea that when women are together and they start to menstruate or get on each other's cycles, I don't really, to be honest, I don't really know. I've, like, um, I hear it all the time, but I don't know if there's, I don't know the science behind it. Could it be also like, um, we don't know. Could you be like just noticing them more in her and then you're noticing more in you? It could be that simple. Or is there like some communal thing that's going on where we're like sending signals to each other? I don't know. But I do think it's interesting because you'll hear this a lot, women going through perimenopause and like maybe a daughter um, going through puberty is like they'll start to like really kind of um, uh, kind of um, play off each other a little bit in terms of their hormonal volatility. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think there's a lot left to learn. Um, and there's probably a reason you're spiking up and down and probably that therefore in perimenopause. Um, and then your daughter's going through the same sort of thing. So hers are like revving up and then yours are just kind of doing the opposite, which is kind of revving down. But menopause one day will be lovely because then you'll feel nice and steady. I do think there's like, I think there's probably something. We just, there's just no good way to measure it. And it doesn't make sense that one person's physiologic um, experience would affect someone else's. But I think that's sort of where this, like, you get into the like energy transfer stuff, you know? But I think there's, there's gotta be something there because we hear it all the time. And as a mom of three girls, I am telling you the four of us, watch out we are like all together because we all cycled at the same and then if one was earlier sure enough it either threw me off and i agree so there is no science behind it and i don't know the science behind it either but it happened for <laughs> four of us at home yeah, yeah. Um, i'm a 48 year old perimenopausal novelist and you guys Academic, so I have been researching the F out of all of it. Yes. Um, but my question is actually about menopause and the transitional period that happens after, um, or for a few years, kind of offboarding, as it were. Um, I yeah. was listening to Dr. Lisa Mosconi, yeah. who is um, a really amazing, really interesting neuroscientist who's doing work on menopause and the women's brain. Um, and brain health specifically, but she was saying that the few years of volatility beforehand in perimenopause is kind of mirrored postmenopausally by a period of several years of volatility afterwards. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. There is this three to five years where what we think, well, we're still doing a lot of research on the brain, but what she's done great research on and just a, a lovely person and great scientist and really leading the forefront of like, we should be studying women's brains through this transition is that um, one, this is sort of a heatherism. I think that if there's any reason for perimenopause, I think it's to get our bodies used to the lowering levels because we see when women have sudden menopause, like if anyone had their ovaries immediately taken out, they just poof, have symptoms that are much worse, um, can gain more weight, are very symptomatic. So there may be some biologic reason that we go through perimenopause, which is this slowly adjusting time. So, um, and this is because I think one of the organs that's impacted the most is the brain. In fact, that's where um, hot flashes or the heat intolerance comes from is actually the hypothalamus. And then of course we've got our prefrontal cortex, which is where we have things like our cognition, our multitasking and all of those things. And then the amygdala, which is like our emotions. And so the brain is so impacted by the changes in hormones. So then what her research shows is that there's sort of receptors that hypertrophy um, a few years after menopause where they're kind of like looking for like estrogen or looking for hormones. Um, so you get this sort of these brain changes in this early postmenopausal phase, whether it's three years, five years, um, where the receptors are constantly looking for estrogen. Um, and then there's some, um, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but sort of like some neuronal connections that are kind of like being either fired down or reestablished. And then the good news when it comes to the brain fog is there's research to show that in after those sort of three years or so, 
the brain foggy stuff can kind of resolve and go away. And after those three to five years, for some women, the hot flashes can kind of resolve and go away. It's almost like those receptors then finally are like, okay, the gig's up. Um, however, um, we know that it's very variable. For some women, like 10% of women, they never give up. Those are probably all of our patients because <laughs> they're like, huh. Um, and there's also probably variability in what, you know, do they start in late perimenopause? How long does it go through perimenopause? These sort of neuronal and brain changes um, to their that place where it can kind of go back to, quote, normal. Although, you know, I don't know if we ever go back to normal. I don't know if normal exists, but, you know, some of those brain changes can... Um, I guess, for lack of better words, kind of go back to normal. Um, what is the stadium on HRT? Does that mean it's just transitioning out? Or yeah, so then we think what estrogen is doing, well, and so twofold. The one other thing I was going to say before the estrogen is that, but it's not just the brain, because there's also the rest of your body that's changing with the loss of estrogen. So, for example, vaginal dryness, I can't believe no one's asked about vaginas yet, vaginal dryness um, is never going to get better. Unlike like the brain or the brain fog or the cognition, there may be this, and it could, it could be a 10 year period, which is like, not like a hot minute. That's like a decade of like the peak of your career from like, let's say 45 to 55, or for you, you know, like 35 to like 55. Again, it can be very variable where you might have brain fog, hot flashes, anxiety, depression, insomnia, all of those things that may resolve, but there are other things in the body without hormone therapy that are not gonna get better. So the, if you have vaginal dryness, Estrogen's really important, so estrogen's not coming back, so the vagina's not gonna like, poof, like unfortunately go back to normal. Neither will the bones or your cardiovascular system. So anyways, I think then what is estrogen doing to this time? So we, we don't fully know, but estrogen actually, especially postmenopausal estrogen, like your little patch, is actually a really low level of estrogen. Meaning if your daughters, if your daughters took her patch and put it on, like nothing would probably happen. They'd be like, da da da, because um, they're probably making tons of estrogen. So we're giving a little bit of estrogen that's kind of satisfying the receptors. And so they're like, ah, okay. And, you know, things can just kind of get better. And so this is why we see you can take hormone therapy for as long as you like. Um, but we do see, even in the women's health study, if you took it for six years, five years, seven years, and then took it off, you actually maintained benefits like brain health benefits um, and cardiovascular benefits and bone health benefits even after you take the hormone therapy off. So it's kind of doing something in that crucial window of like late perimenopause through the early perimenopausal stage in the brain that's kind of like lessening sort of all of the changes that are happening. And while I'm still on my like um, literal like soapbox. Um, I think that also with, this is just a Heather thing, but with the craziness of life in 2024 and women having careers and children and then like environmental toxins and like stress and all these things, I think our brains are now like on overdrive. Um, meaning, um, I, I wonder, but I don't think we have great data to know, like what was the perimenopausal transition like in the forties or fifties? It was still probably pretty rough. But has it, are our symptoms longer lasting? Are, um, are they more bothersome because we just have more stress and more toxins? I have no idea, but like, I kind of wonder, like it would be interesting if we had great historical data to show. So that was a long winded answer of a lot of it. We don't yet still know. I'm so, so grateful for Lisa Moscone and her data and her lab on the brain changes. Cause I think that's what's impacted the most. Um, and I think that basically estrogen kind of tampers down or kind of eases this like um, 10 years sort of neurocognitive changes uh, that I think still going on, but it's kind of just like tampering it down and helping it. And that there's benefits even if you take the hormone therapy off in terms of the brain changes later, although many women choose to stay on hormone therapy. And that doesn't apply to the rest of your body, which definitely does benefit from estrogen typically. Whew. Okay, did that make sense? <laughs> All right, that was a good one, Wendy. But I think, no, I'm not done. Wow. But. <laughs> I think like, you know, anthropo anthropology or anthropology, prof I've had some anthropology professors over the time. I can think of one when I was at Ohio State and just looking back through the records of 
or what we do have are limited amount of like what was perimenopause and menopause like for different cultures and different time periods. Now we didn't always live to be 80 and 90, but we definitely still went through menopause. Um, there's not a lot to, there's not a lot there, but it's like, oh, don't you wish we had like any, anything, any little scraps of it we can find. Um, and actually one of the things of Jen Gunter's book that I really liked the most was this thing called the grandmother effect. Did you read that part? Having a woman, a woman who is not able to reproduce, <clears throat> menopausal ladies, um, around um, to help like gather food um, and bring food to the, like her, let's say the the mother that's lactating or potentially her child. So if she's the grandmother, helps like the families. And so I thought that was so interesting. And I don't know if everyone has the same experience, but you know, when you have a baby and your mom comes and just like brings you all the food, like or like you're sick, and what do people do? Just bring you food, you know. And so I thought that was interesting. And certainly I think menopause has been around because I also hear people say like, oh, we used to die at 40 or we never really experienced menopause. Pro probably we didn't all, but I think some women did and there was an evolutionary um, uh, reason for it. But again, now we spend sometimes half our lives. Essentially what uh, happens with stress, whether it's like environmental stress, environmental toxins, is they will zap the rapidly dividing cells in our body. And the, rap the place where we have a lot of rapidly dividing cells is our thyroid, um, but also our ovaries. Those are rapidly dividing cells. And so you do have to wonder, with the stress um, and that's impacting those rapidly dividing cells, which make our estrogen is, you know, I don't, I don't want to put any theories out there that I can't back up, but it's just something that a lot of women have been asking me lately. Are women experiencing perimenopause earlier? Are they experiencing it longer? Are they experiencing more symptoms? And I'm like, I honestly don't know because I don't have great records from the 70s, well, 80s, 90s, 2000s of like what was perimenopause like. Um, so it's not to be an alarmist by any means, but just kind of something that I've kind of been p kicking around. And I think a lot of women are interested in asking, you know, so or is it or is it just that we're all talking about it more? Right. And so we're all putting it together. Not sure which one. Okay, well, we have a lot of food here, too, and beverages. And then I know Heather's happy to chat with people, and I'll chat with people. And Heather's cards are there, and her books are here, and we'll take some photos. And um, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Abby and Bernadette and Christina, because it was really nice to be supported by my colleagues and my friends and everybody that came, and Dr. Heather. And I hope that you guys will go and tell your friends and like spread the word and um, help make sure that we don't have to suffer. It's something that's gonna affect all of us in this room. And like, uh, it's something that affects everyone who is a woman with ovaries in every country, in every zip code. It's, you know, and it's, it's there isn't one postal code. I was just in Europe, so she was like, don't say zip code, say post. There isn't one zip code where it doesn't women have it better or easier or have better access in, in all honesty. And so it's something that when you talk to your friends, that is going to really push the push us to like keep talking about this more. So yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to Rebecca and thank you to Natalie. Um, we, you know, it's such a blessing that you guys wanted to sit and listen to us talk about menopause for um, an hour or so. Anyways, I will just stay on my little perch, I guess. And if anyone wants to ask me questions or Lindsay or Rebecca or Natalie, we'd love to just chat with you. I can't wait to hear more about like your practice. Yeah. And anyways, I know. Mm -hmm. And please do. Please do.